Here's another integrated Y. There's going to be a lot of them because, you know, with everything here, there's so many um, facets and perspectives that it takes a long time to thresh out and explain something that really you yourself could figure out if you spent the time on it. So that's what we're doing here. I need to talk about it, and apparently you're benefiting from listening to it, apparently from God directly, because I don't know how to say it rightly for you. So with that in mind, here's what the next increment about integrated wise is. And it's real simple. Actually I already covered is everything else in the Bible in First Corinthians twelve. The analogy there is to a body. That all of us are designed by God to fit together as a body. And when Paul's writing that out, he's thinking of the prayer that will be later recorded by John in John 17, that Christ prayed the night that he was arrested. You know, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. I'm praying not only for these, but for those who will hear them. This is the legal language he used. John 17, about verse 20 and following. Those who will hear them. Now, if you're trained in contract law the way I am, Immediately when you read that, you know what he's talking about. If you're not trained in contract law, you might gloss over that little phrase. The, the, the art of writing good law is to aptly phrase something with as few words as possible. That's why the Bible is such a genius when it comes to law. Anybody who's trained in law, is, even if they don't believe in the Bible, is kind of blown away by the economy of language and how well a thing is stated once they understand what it says. It really is. I mean, people who don't believe in God at all and think that, you know, the whole idea of some invisible sky daddy is a laughable thing, they will still admit to you that there's that the Bible is really great literature. Literature is another way of saying law. The art of good literature is to have an economy of wording so that with a few words you say a lot and then the idea is that those few words because they're few are easy to remember and then while you're walking to Ephesus or spinning flax or doing some other you know low-level job you can think about what those words mean that's exactly the way the Bible's written that's what it's for Okay, so now think about that. Words. A few words that actually say a lot when you play them out. You string them together with what? Other words. So that it forms what? A body of words. Scripture is a body of words. Each word is itself, its own life, its own meaning, independent, on its own, ensured by God to have an independent, free life. The word we. The word will. The word believe. String them together, we will believe. Well, that's a whole nother meaning now, isn't it? And yet each word retains its own individual life and meaning. But when synergized, put together, whoa! That's what Christ was praying for. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them in truth. I don't only ask for these, meaning the apostles and the people alive right then, but for those who will hear their word. Notice that. Those who will hear their word. How many is that? Christ doesn't say. So then what do you know? 
Now I'm talking kind of like a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, but I do the law. You can do law without being a lawyer in certain respects. Okay, what does that mean? Those who will hear, who defines who those are, who defines how many they are, who defines how long they are, who defines what hearing is. See the point? See how open-ended that is? Christ is praying for God, Father, to determine who will hear. Well, how do you do that? Well, first you have to decide who's going to be born. So how many future souls is Christ going to be paying for on the cross as a result of those four words he prayed? Those who will hear. He prays four words. How many millions upon millions of souls are going to be born as a result of him praying those four words? Because it's up to Father's discretion. That's what he's saying. So he is committing, before he goes to the cross, he's committing himself to have this unbelievably high pain in advance. Up to Father's discretion. How much, how many souls are going to be the ones who will hear? And all of their sins, and all of their life, and all the cost of sustaining them for throughout their life here. He's committing to paying for it in advance by that prayer. The whole body of each soul and the body of all the souls put together, including, of course, those who will not hear. Because if you're going to be free, you have to be free to hear. So you have to be born. Now what, then, is the integrated why? Well, first thing, you can see very clearly, hopefully, Christ prayed for it, so Father's going to do it. Father will not deny his son. Christ paid on the cross for all the world, even the world not yet born, 1 John 2, 2. So Father can justify creating those souls at the first birth, Genesis 2, 7, soul imputed to the exiting fetus at birth. That's always what the Bible says. It never says anything else. If you're a pro-lifer, you're anti-God. And you don't even know. The body is not spiritual. What's inside the soul is life. What's inside the soul goes on to the next life. The body dies. The body's dead when it's born. The body's born dead in Adam, Romans 5.12. Greek tense is arist. It's hamartano. It means to miss the mark, a.k.a. sin. The body's born in sin. That's what David said. I was born in sin. Yeah, because sin is biological. It's an urge that you give in to with your soul later on in life, and that's how your soul becomes tainted. In essence, Adam's original sin is committed by each one of us sometime soon after we're born. It's not the same sin, but it is a sin. It's the first sin, original sin. That's what the Bible says. Theology hasn't gotten it right till yet. I'm sorry about that. I can't help them. Bible's plain. The body of the words in the Bible, when you read them, and they're not in English. After a while, you start to be able to put the words together. And they form the thought pattern in your own soul. And the objective is for your own soul to be able to reflect, be like Christ's own soul. That's what he was praying for. In John 17, that's what Father's doing to us as a gift to him. Psalm 110, whole book of Hebrews. A body of us. Just like a body of words. Each word having its own life and its own identity and its own function. But strung together with a bunch of other words. 
That's the body of Christ. Like a mosaic. When you look up close at a mosaic, you see a bunch of individual stones and they're, you know, usually cemented together with something else. When you stand back, far back from the mosaic, then you see a whole picture. That's the way it is with us. Each one of us, we're living our own independent lives. And yeah, we bump around together with each other, and we think we have a certain relevance, you know, vis-a-vis our own lives and vis-a-vis each other, but we really don't see the big picture. And so we feel a little, you know, nervous all the time. What does my life mean? What is it doing? Why am I here? We don't know what God is doing with the big picture. All we do know, and even that is sort of like, more or less just believing it, not really seeing it, is that we believe that he's got, you know, he's working everything together for good. Romans 8, 28. Yeah, he is. And the Bible actually tells you how, but if you don't know it, then you don't know what he's doing. And even when you know how, and even when you know what he's doing, and even when you know what scripture says, you still can't see it. You're believing what you understand, even though you can't see it. But Paul's trying to explain how you can see it, even when you don't see it, in Rome, in 1 Corinthians 12. A body. When you move your fingers to grasp a spoon, your fingers have their own life. Your will is telling your fingers what to do. Your fingers do not have any comprehension of the import of what you're telling them to do. They only know one thing. You're telling them to do X. Your fingers obey your will. Their fingers are not your will. Your will is the one that sees the big picture of what you're telling your fingers to do. Because your fingers are, technically speaking, independent of your will as well as being attached and bound to it, your fingers might not obey you, especially later in life. If your fingers are cut off from certain other parts of your body, certain other, what you want to call the lymphatic system, the um, you know, the circulatory system, the nerve system, if they're cut off in some key way from that, they cannot obey what you will. There's a disconnect. So now your will, which sees the big picture, is not accomplishing your will because of the disconnect. In all events, that part of the body doesn't really know the big picture. Only you know at the top, as it were, in the head. Because you're the one willing the whole thing in the first place. So the integrated why of God is something he knows and he sees at all times and likes it. Or it wouldn't be happening right now. He likes ensuring freedom. Even the freedom to be bad. Why he likes it? Well, we can't really tell. But we believe him. Meanwhile, each one of us is part of this hall. And we each have, as it were, our own little stuff during the day. And we don't know how it fits together. But just like the body, if we are saying no, then our part in the whole is not working. So then the whole, and that's what Paul was trying to explain in 1 Corinthians 12, is affected. Now, does God have a plan for that? Sure, he foreknows who's going to screw up. I screw up every single day. He foreknew that. If I didn't know that he foreknew that, I couldn't go on functioning because how am I going to get it right? How are you going to get it right? 
The fact that there are many of us, 99.9% of us, who get it almost completely wrong is kind of beside the point. All of us get it wrong often during a day. In other words, pot kettle black. Is Obama bad? Yeah. He doesn't wake up in the morning and say, gee, I'd like to be bad today. He's not doing it on purpose. But is he bad? Yeah. Am I? Yeah. Is he worse than me? Well, I really don't know. I'm not inside his soul, so I don't know. I can't adjudicate between the fact that he has zero Bible doctrine in, in him, whereas I have a lot. So then who should be more responsible for screw-ups, me or him? Shouldn't I be more responsible? And that gets to the heart of this. I'm a cog in the whole wheel of God. He's a cog in the whole wheel of God. I have knowledge of Bible. I have knowledge of God. He has none. Per God, who should be more responsible for screw-ups? Shouldn't I be? Per God, who should have the higher privilege when not screwing up? Shouldn't I? Per God, when he's going to decide what kind of blessing to bless the human race, to the extent I haven't screwed up and I've been thinking the Bible rightly before him, shouldn't the blessing flow through me? And those are all juridical questions. And I don't know that I would argue that that's what he ought to do because maybe he should flow the blessing through Obama. It wouldn't bother me as long as it pleases God. I don't care. But if we're going to talk about working parts and we're going to talk about integrated wise, the fact of the matter remains is that there's a priesthood forever, not just down here. Forever in the eternal state, there's a priesthood. Why? Because some learn Bible. The words, see, John 17, those who will hear, some learn those words really well. So they get to be the heads of the body in the eternal state. But there needs to still be a body. Every part having its own role. And the difference between eternity and now is that in eternity, everybody's determined by his own free will what role he wants. The brother foot in eternity has chosen to be a foot down here. So maybe Obama will be a foot in eternity. I hope he's saved. I want everybody saved. I don't want anybody in hell. Of course, God doesn't want that more, Second Peter 3, 9. God is never willing that any should perish, but that everyone should have eternal life. That's a corrected translation from the Greek. I don't want anybody to go to hell. Okay, but if they're not going to go to hell and they don't have Bible doctrine, where else can they go? Brother Foot. So my will determines my fingers and my feet. The feet don't know. The hand doesn't know. But it would still be better for the hand and the foot if the hand and the foot have consciousness that they be in accord with the head. Because then they can say, oh, I'm doing the will of the head. So they share in the head. God is the head of us all. Someday, some of us, it's less than a thousand people throughout history. Someday, some of us, a thousand or less, will be the heads of kingdoms. And everybody in those kingdoms will be an extension of the king. So that's like head versus body. That's what Paul's talking about. That's an integration. That's a why. 
And then the lowest among us can still say, oh, I'm doing the will of the head, even if I'm a toenail. Now, it is only a toenail. It is a small job. It is of low esteem. But at least you're part of the tone. At least you're living a noble life in eternity, no matter how small. And there's no shame in that. Yeah, you could have gotten it better down here. Yeah, you screwed it up down here. But that's all over now. And yeah, you're a toenail forever in the kingdom that you belong to. But at least you're a noble toenail. See how valid God's thinking is when he uses the body analogy in 1 Corinthians 12. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He's never willing that any should perish. Second Peter 3, 9. But that doesn't mean that he's stupid. If you want the job of a royal toenail forever, by means of saying no to God in this life, well then you get to be that in the next. So then all the evil and stupidity that you did in this life will be flipped over by God to ennoble or raise or develop somebody who learned Bible better than you did. Okay, so then in the eternity when you're a noble toenail, you can boast in how God used your wrong to make somebody else more right. And at that point, it'll be a pleasure to you. See why those integrated whys are so important to know. Romans 8, 28 really does work. Now you know better why. So go talk to God about it.